Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about blood types. Blood typing wasn't that big a deal back in the day because when we were cavemen, it didn't really exist this whole idea of transfusing blood from one person to another. But with modern medicine, it's actually become a really big deal. Now, you should know this in humans, the ones that I'll talk about in this podcast is going to be the ABO blood typing. And another one I'll talk about is the RH factor. Uh, but know that this, that there are about another 30 other families of blood types. And what are we talking about when we're talking about blood types? Well, basically, we're talking about proteins that are found on the surface of our blood cells or our erythrocytes. And so basically, if we're looking at the ABO system, if you are type A blood, which I happen to be type A blood, that means that you're going to have an A protein or a specific protein on the surface of your blood. If you are type B blood, then you're going to have a B protein on the surface of your blood. And this is just a comic version. They're going to be really, really tiny. You wouldn't be able to see them. They're just little proteins on the surface or glycoproteins that are found on the surface of the blood. So if you think about it, what if you're type AB blood? Well, basically that means that you have both types of proteins. And if you're type O, that means that you have none of these specific proteins that are found on your blood. And so um, each of these have arisen through our evolutionary history, but they actually are really important when we're trying to move blood from one person to another. And that's because of our immune response. And so if you're type A blood, and so let's remember that that's that purple kind of a protein, that pointy purple protein, well, basically, you're going to have that type of blood, but you're going to have antibodies for the other type, the B antibody, we call that. And the reason why is that you have antibodies for every shape possible except the shape that you actually have. And so we're not going to have purple antibodies, but we're going to have these B antibodies, and that's just because we don't have that B protein around. Likewise, if we look at type B blood, it's going to have the B proteins, but it would be silly for us to have those B antibodies because it would just simply attack our own blood. But instead, we're going to have the type A antibodies. If we look at somebody who's type AB blood, well, since they have both of these antigens or both of these proteins on their surface, A and B, then we really wouldn't want to have any other antibodies because, again, they would attack our blood. And then finally, if you're type O, basically if you're type O, since you don't have either of these proteins, then you're going to have antibodies that match up that specific shape. And so again, the antibodies are there simply to protect our body against invasion or against invaders. And so now let's look at type A. Let's say you're type A blood. And so we said we got the purple pointy proteins. You're going to have the B antibodies. Let's say that we give that person type O blood. Well, what's going to happen? Well, since there are no proteins on its surface, nothing will happen. So it's OK to transfer type O blood to somebody who's type A. Nothing happens. But let's say we give them type B blood. Well, that type B blood is going to have the B proteins. And so basically, those B antibodies are going to grab onto it. They're going to attack that. And we could die as a result of that. And that's why it's important that when we're giving somebody blood transfusion, we make sure that we type their blood because our, otherwise our antibodies are going to attack it. Let's say we've got now type B blood. Again, we've got the A antibodies. Let's say we give that person A blood. Well, you probably can figure this out. Basically, all of those antibodies are going to glom onto that type A blood. And so we could die as a result of that. Now let's look at somebody who has type AB blood. Well, let's give them type A blood. Well, since they have no antibodies, at least for this protein, nothing would happen. Or if we give them type B blood, nothing will happen. Or we give them type O blood, nothing will happen. And so we like to think of AB as the universal recipient. In other words, it can get blood from any other type, and it's going to be fine. But if we look at type O blood, type O blood, since it has the other antibodies, if we throw anything with a protein, especially like AB blood, you can see that all the antibodies are going to grab onto that. And so it's really important when we're giving blood from one person to another that we match that blood. Now, if you're trying to solve genetics problems using blood, you simply have to memorize this. Because it's really hard to just answer questions dealing with blood type unless you understand the genetics behind it. And it's not simple Mendelian genetics. So basically, there are four different phenotypes. So you could be type A, B, AB, or O. But there are six different genotypes. And so if you're type A, like I am, you could be A because you have both of these alleles for A, or you're homozygous. Or you could be heterozygous. You could have one of the alleles for the A protein, but the other one doesn't make a protein at all. That's how you get the type O. If you have two alleles 
and neither of those express the protein. If you're type B, again, you could be homozygous for both of those, or you could be heterozygous. But if you're type AB blood, then you're going to have to have one of each. And so we call this expression, well, multiple alleles, because we have more than one allele. We have three in this case. And also it's codominant, because if you're type A and B, you don't have like one being dominant. You're actually expressing both of those. And so if you're ever trying to solve problems, they're never going to give you this genotype. So you really have to memorize this. Uh, I or uh, the AP folks are just simply going to ask you a question like this. Is it conceivable that we could have a father who is type A and a mother who is type O and they could have offspring that are going to be type B, we'll say for example. Well to solve this let's look at uh, a couple of Punnett squares. If you're type A, we just write that across the top. So you could be this, you could be homozygous for that A. We know that the O is going to look like this, and so we could figure out that all of the offspring, if the parent is homozygous, is going to be type A. But if we kind of delete that a second, let's say that they are heterozygous for it. Let's say that person who's type A is going to be like that, and then O looks like this. Well, we could get this possibility. This person would be type A blood, but we could also get this possibility with this one being type O blood. Or you could solve questions like this. Let's say that we have one parent who's A and one parent who's B. What possibilities could we have for their offspring? Well, let's look. If one is A and one is B, if they're both homozygous, then we would have AB blood for all of their offspring. But let's set it up another way. Let's set it up like this. Let's say that one is heterozygous for it, like that. And then the other one is heterozygous for that trait. So let's say dad is B, but he's heterozygous for that trait. Well, if we look at this possibility in fertilization, this person would be type AB blood. This person right here is going to get the A from up here and the I from over here. So this would be type A blood. This one right here would be B blood. And then this one right here, since you're getting both of these little I's, is going to be type O. So if you have an A and a B, you could conceivably get A, B, B, A, or O type blood coming from that. And so make sure you understand the different genotypes that we have, especially up here for those who are type A and type B. Next thing that I want to talk about is quickly the RH factor. RH is simply another set of proteins. This is a little simpler to do genetics problems with RH factor because you either have it or you don't. Either you're RH positive and you have these RH factors. RH came from, uh, they did some early studies on the rhesus monkey to identify this protein. RH negative, you don't have it. And so what antibodies is an RH positive going to have? Well, neither. It's going to have none of those antibodies, but if you're Rh negative, then you're going to have those Rh plus antibodies. And so the genetics are pretty simple. If you're Rh positive, you could be either homozygous or you could be heterozygous. If you're Rh negative, then you're going to be uh, homozygous negative. So which is dominant? Dominant is going to be the Rh positive. And so if we have a parent, uh, two parents who are Rh positive, is it conceivable that they could have offspring who are Rh negative, for sure. If they're both homozygous, we could just go like this. These would be the two offspring. This one would be Rh positive, Rh positive, Rh positive, and this could be an Rh negative. And so the genetics are pretty simple, but there's a, something that you really want to be aware of. Now, if we've got a mom right here, and let's say she's Rh negative, and then we have a dad who's Rh positive, is it conceivable that they could have an offspring who ends up being Rh positive? Well, for sure. And so basically what happens is during the first pregnancy, nothing really happens because we're only sending antibodies in one direction from mom to, to baby. But during childbirth, there's a lot of blood that gets mixed. And so basically what can happen is during subsequent pregnancies, now mom is going to start to build up a lot of these Rh plus antibodies. And so during the second pregnancy, she could actually be sending antibodies that could damage that fetus. Now, if we know this, which we do in developed countries, then we can simply uh, give, them, give her a chemical during, I think, the 28th week of gestation, and then we can suppress that immune response. But it's really important that we note that. And so now we finally get to this last big chart, uh, and it's got some really cool information on it. If you look here, it's got the donor and the type of blood they have, and then the recipients and whether or not you could get it. Uh, or, you, or you couldn't. And so if we look at somebody right here, let's say we're giving O minus or O negative blood. 
Well, we could give that to all these people from O all the way to AB. And so that's why we call that O negative, the universal donor. And then if we look down here at AB positive, well, AB positive could get blood from all of these different types. And so we call them like the universal recipient. And so who would uh, they love to see as far as donating blood? It's going to be somebody who's O negative. And what percent of the population is that? 6.6%. And so if we look at some of these uh, percentages, what's the most common? Most common is going to be O positive. Third, almost 38% of the population is going to have that. Same with A positive. And then we're going to have some more obscure blood types like AB negative where it's less than 1% of the population that has that. But there's something unique. If you look at some native populations like native Australian aborigines, we find that B really didn't exist before Europeans showed up. And the same thing in Native Americans. And so we can look at these proteins that really don't have a function, or maybe they have a function that's lost, and we can kind of trace human ancestry. So that's blood typing. Uh, it's important when we switch blood or when we're trying to solve some genetics problems. And so I hope that's helpful.